Any questions from this morning? If you don't have questions, I did not do a good job. While you decide if you have questions, let me, let me explain one thing. I just want to cover this real fast mm-hmm. and then let you go. Alex and I have some additional prepared material that we can do. So if you get questions, you get your nerve up, um, you can raise your hand and interrupt. But in defense of what... So for those who want to make ling- language, um, culture, national language barriers, the, the part of the definition of missions, like, say, the Nine Marks book, Andy Johnson, using ethnic, linguistic, and geographic divides... They're going to probably base their argument in Revelation 5.9, where we see assembled around the throne um, a group of every tribe, language, people, and nation. And from that passage, you might think we've now got four clear um, categories. And so we've got to be thinking of crossing tribal boundaries and language boundaries and people's boundaries and nation, national boundaries. I was interested if that was indeed what's going on. I found two, four, six, seven different um, quartets of those terms. And they're different virtually every time, so let me give them to you. So Revelation 5, 9, tribe, language, people, nation. Revelation 7, 9, nation, tribe, people's languages. Revelation 10, 10, people's, nations, languages, kings. Revelation 11, 9, people's, tribes, languages, nations. Revelation 13, 7, tribe, people, language, nation. Revelation 14, 6, nation, tribe, language, people. And Revelation 17, 15, people's, multitudes, nations, and languages. From which I conclude, it's less that we've got four clear categories and more through the variation of terms, the variation of order. The emphasis is in the totality, similar to the greatest commandment to love the Lord with all your heart and soul and mind. And you find it in the Gospels with additional words added in like heart, right? What's the point? All of you. And I think the emphasis in Revelation is everybody, all sorts of people. And so it's less about we've got to cross language barriers, we've got to cross this barrier. We've got to get everybody. The word has to go out to all creation. That's the language Mark uses. So that's why I didn't include that as a definition. The other part being it's hard to hold Paul to that standard um, because he's really going within one Roman Empire. There's all these different subcultures and peoples, but like I said, there's no indication Paul crosses any linguistic barriers. Um, anyway, okay. Liz. Uh, would you consider adoption a type of mission? Absolutely. You just bring the disciples to you. Absolutely. Um, well, and the other thing that's beautiful about adoption is adoption is a picture of the gospel. So Romans 8, we've been adopted by God. I can't justify anybody. I can't save anybody. But one of the few parts of salvation I can imitate is we could adopt. And I've heard Vody Bauckham say this. He's, he's adopted most of his children. Like, here's this one thing in the gospel that I can imitate. I can't, I can't save anybody. I can't take their sins upon me. But in adoption, we get, we get to imitate and image this beautiful picture of the gospel. So, yeah, absolutely. Dave. Um, when the microphone I, does not appear to be on or you're not speaking into it. Try again. Hello? Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Acts 13, 2 and 3, you mentioned, Mm -hmm. uh, while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me, Barnabas, and Saul for the work which I have called them. Then when they had fasted and prayed, laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So I sort of a question then asking for a comment to verse 2. While they were ministering to the Lord, I find that an interesting phrase. We minister to one another. How do we minister to the Lord and what does that mean that we're doing? So they were, that's what they were doing, and they were also fasting, and it seems to be something we don't do today. So maybe a comment on that, too, and how do those two That is a together? fantastic question. I'm going to punt until next week because I'm not—no, part of next week. Next week's what's the church's job? So I, I plan to talk through the fasting, the praying, the looking for, the beseeching, and I want time to give you a good answer because I'm not entirely sure what ministering to the Lord means. So rather mm-hmm. than bluffing, let me come back in a week, and Alex love the answer. <laughs> and <one> next time. <laughs> The, the ESV says they were worshiping the Lord. Well, that's what I want to look up is the Greek behind that. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. freely, it's interesting. I don't feel competent at the moment to speak to that. So give me a week and one of us will get back to you on that. But that's the focus next week. Is, okay, what's the church's role and job in this? And so we'll be looking at that exact passage from the other vantage point, not with the camera on Paul and Barnabas, but the camera on the church. 
So, so hold me to that, but that's the plan. Okay. Lee, then Jordan. Uh, well, this is the, the P- Paul's missionary methods. Mm-hmm. We, there are many missionaries that basically break all those rules. Yes. Yeah. What about that? And we, we support some of them. And does that mean then we need to reevaluate Potentially. things? That is, when we pause, Alex is ready. He's actually asked his topic to address. So give me a second. No, okay. absolutely. Yeah. Now, and part of this, let me say, is the pattern we have is a pattern. Some of the pattern can be broken. I'm not saying someone's sinning if they send themselves. That's not the pattern I see, so I'm not nearly feeling so obligated to partner with somebody. But if somebody just one day says, by Jove, I want to go preach Christ in India, God bless them. Like, then yeah. I don't think, I'm not going to rebuke them, right? Yeah. Um, I'm going to be less inclined to say the church needs to partner with them. I think it's more of a freedom. Maybe we will, maybe we won't. But um, I wouldn't say that that's wicked. So you can not, we know what Paul does do. We know what he's renounced. There are things that are bad. And then maybe there's a third category. Scripture doesn't condemn that, but neither does it give us that. Huh. You know, so I'm willing to say altering the text of Scripture. Paul says, frankly, he doesn't do that, so you shouldn't do that. If someone wants to use other means, we can talk through that, and it can be closer or further from... from, I'll give you an example. uh, They'll go and do gospel plays. No, I know people have been to... um, Oh, man, where Ronnie and Chris go? They go to... Uh, not Argentina, I'm getting the wrong word, it's Armenia. And they'll put on, like, theater. Like, I have nothing negative to say about that. I don't see that in Scripture, unless you want to suggest that, like, Ezekiel no, they're li- like lying acting on his side. Out, acting out yeah, s- the story. Piece, yeah, yeah. But no, right. so, so there's something that I have no objection to, Right. but neither does Scripture lead me to that conclusion. I'm like, okay, fair enough. No. You know, and I would only object if instead of plain declaration of truth, they did that. Now, if alongside of Right. The plain, plain declaration of the truth, they're doing that. Okay, fair enough. But if they say, yeah, we don't preach, we don't teach, we just do theater, then I'd say something's probably off. Because the primary means is that. But Alex will hit that in a moment. Well, oh, part, no. of it, well part of what it, the thing about renouncing underhanded tactics. Because what, what is an underhanded tactic? Is that when you're hiding? You're not supposed to let anybody really know? You're, the, you're anticipating all of the stuff okay. Alex is doing. Give all it right. yeah, yeah. Take it. Yeah. Go, That's Alex. Okay. Go. That's okay. fine. Alex, we've got fine. a fertile ground, Alex. No, Hold fine. on. But That's Jordan, fine. and then we'll... Then we'll uh, yeah. Um, I just wanted to thank you for clarifying um, just the fact that the local church missionaries and the idea of missions falls under the Great Commission, and it's not missions is the same as the Great Commission, or yeah. as one. Because yeah. um, I think... A lot of, I mean, I grew up being taught that the Great Commission was missions, and right. the local church had a part to play to support the Great Commission, but they didn't play an active part in that umbrella. So I really appreciated that. Um, and then my question was, um, you touched on, oh, what was it? Paul strengthens and establishes form- formative churches. Yeah. So um, is it an expectation for the missionaries that we send out that once a church has been established and they do have elders and then they're trained to go out and reach other people in their area, is it an expectation for those missionaries to frequently visit and remain in contact with that church that they have Well, that's, that's certain. It was interesting is that's part of what Paul and Barnabas disagree over. So I would less make it rules. In Acts 15, when Paul, Paul says, hey, let's go visit the churches, and Barnabas is like, no, let's go off over here, and then they disagree about John Mark. That's the pattern we see in Paul. I don't... I don't want to say you have to do exactly what Paul does it. So we're looking at patterns. Yeah, that seems to be an appropriate thing for missionaries to do. But if a missionary just labors in one place and never leaves because there's never a formed church, I'm not going to say you failed. So I would much more put, yeah, I would expect normally, regularly, that seems totally fitting unless you have to do it. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. Okay. 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 Deb, and then we'll let out. Okay. Deb. There you go. What I'm uh, about to say is probably part of Alex's, because it's sort of like Lee's. But if he could make sure and touch, if he has a chance. Um, I was part of a church that actually decided to pray and support a 
pastor that was going to New England to preach the gospel. No, no, that's the entire, no, 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 <laughs> and, no, no. And in our own country. No, no, praise, no, 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 pause, hold on, hold on. Don't think just because it's not missions, it's not yeah. Great Commission. So yeah. when I gave this definition to my wife, who's not here, so I can talk about her, um, <laughs> she said to me, so her father has planted and, or revitalized five or six churches on the West Coast. His title is Church Planting Missionary to the United States. And she said, not, not cynically and not bitterly, so you're saying my father's not a missionary. He's not doing what Paul did. And so if I'm drawing my circle, and again, we can define the term however you want. You can say our kids are missionaries. I don't know if that's helpful. I, I don't know if it's helpful to call every bit of the Great Commission missions. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think we've got these unique people like Paul, these unique Third John people. I'm going to limit, I'm arguing I think it's useful to limit our definition to that, but I can't insist upon that because missions isn't a biblical term. So we can define it how we want. So I'm trying to give, I think this is a useful boundary marker. So no, given that boundary marker, her father is doing fantastic, great commission work. I'd be in favor in principle of supporting it. I don't see why I wouldn't. I don't think we're obligated to support it, but I think we're free to in the churches that do, but I wouldn't call it, he's building where there's a foundation. There's no question. In the same sense that I think I'm participating in the Great Commission. I'm building on a massive foundation of men who've come before. So and that's, that, that's yeah. the distinction I'm trying to make. So that's why I'm saying the part of the problem is missions gets worked up to be such an exciting term. It's so exciting, missions. That if people feel like, oh, it's only Great Commission, I was hoping it would be missions. Like, we're doing it wrong, if that's the case. The Great Commission is what God is doing. Let me, 1 Corinthians 3, and then I will hand it to you, Alex. To reiterate, to reiterate your point, Jordan, you want the proof that we're all engaged in one project. 1 Corinthians 3. And I'd hammer this. 5 to 9. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Slaves through whom he believed. As the Lord assigned to each. I planted Apollos water. There's your missionary. There's your pastor. God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are, what's it say? One, the same. We're doing the same work. We're co-workers. We're on the same team, right? He who waters and he who plants, Paul and Apollos, he who plants and he who waters are one. Each will receive his wages according to his labor, for we are God's fellow workers. God's the one actually at work, and we're either working with him or we're not working with him. And if we're working together, the missionary, the local church, we're fellow workers with God, which is partly why this whole thing started with, the, here's what God's doing. We can join with him in doing what he's doing or not. But, but Paul then uses this picture of laboring in a field. We are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. So think of cultivating a field. And you've got to pull rocks out. and You've got to, you've got to aerate it. And you've got to pull up the weeds. And, and part of the field, we've put a little fence around. We're calling that missions. That's why there's no foundation. There's been no tilling whatsoever. If you want to use the, you've got to till some of it. There's just been no work done there. And some of it just needs some weeds and needs some rocks pulled out and needs some fertilizer. But we're trying to cultivate this field and we're working with God together in one project of making disciples. And then missions, or Paul's part in this, the planting part of that, is distinct from and complementary with Apollos and the church. We're all doing the same project together. We're co-laborers. We're on the same team in the same project. Yeah, I th- and I think the difference in that case is, you know, the church is free to support, and it, you know, depending on the situation, like it, it may be a good thing to support someone like that, but there's not an oughtedness. Yeah. Whereas if if God were to raise up a missionary, like how we're defining missionary, like we're not free to say mm, no thanks. Right. As a church. So, like, take Camp Appanus. What is Camp Appanus but making disciples of young boys and girls down in, where are you guys at? Sorry, yeah, Lake Rathburn area. Now, it's, when we understood the ministry, we were excited to do it. We partner with that because we're helping partner in the Great Commission. But I wouldn't go to every church, you must do this. Like, I'll show them the goodness, the beauty of why we think it's a useful ministry. And we're free to partner with that. And we're partnering with it precisely as trying to fulfill the Great Commission. It's not... By this definition, doing missions work. Now, someone else might define it that way. I'm not going to argue about it. But what sets Paul apart and what sets the men in Third John apart, I'm not doing. I, I don't think Camp Appanus is doing. But we're all doing Great Commission. We're all laboring together. So and it's I, not to say just because it's not missions, we're not going to support it. There's plenty of things we do that support that aren't missions. But Joel and um, Dennis do. 
by this definition, isn't missions. It's great commission. It's evangelism. Praise God. We're happy to invest in it. So that's the notion. It's not as though only missions gets money. Anything furthering the great commission, we're free to partner with. But there is a category where we're not free to say no. We ought to support such people. Okay, who are they? And let's make sure we don't miss them. With that. Oh, go. Yeah. And adoption is something else I'd put into the category of, like, good good work, um, great commission work, not necessarily missions. Right. Um, It's great. You're making disciples. mm -hmm. Send me disciples. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yeah. So with that, Alex is going to talk about underhanded and shit. He knows all about this. <laughs> I th- when I thought, who can talk with us? I thought there's thanks. no one better qualified. Yes. Okay, take away, Alex. And, and the other thing I'd want to say, too, before we get there, okay. is just bringing it back to the local church, not only from the standpoint of being sent, but that's the goal. Like the missionary is seeking to plant local churches um, in, in the context of, of disciple making. So. In fact, while you start, I'm going to go find my teacup that I think is back by my mom. One second. Uh, okay. Question oh. over here. Yes. Oh, we had one question. We, oh, sorry. Sorry, right. I didn't dance over here on the edge oh. of the sanctuary <laughs> to get your attention. Um, I just had a question looking at uh, missions of what we can't ignore, and I'm just thinking about how in our Western church, how we have missions set up. We have a lot of like sending organizations and yeah. then individual missionaries. And then there are people that are in support roles to those missionaries. Yeah. Like You have the missionaries who are out in the jungle with yeah. the unreached people groups, and then you have the people that are on the edge of the jungle, you know, caring and supporting that mission. How does that work with the mission organization and supporting them versus the individual That's a fantastic question, and that's point number two that I'm supposed to address after he gets done with point number one. No, no, great, no. (laughs) It it encourages me that we pick topics you guys want to hear, and you're tracking. That's what I'm supposed to get to as soon as Alex finishes telling us about underhanded, deceitful methods. I'm going to find my tea. I'll be right back. Go take away, Alex. See ya. You're on your own. Well, I mean, I, I think this is a popular topic because there, there are a lot of shenanigans going on in, like, trying to get people into countries that would technically be considered closed access. So you can't put on your visa, hey, I'm a missionary, let me come and share the gospel, right? Um, and so what, what are some of the things that people are doing? What are the boundaries, um, some of it is gray area. Like, I'll freely admit, there are a lot of things out there that I probably don't even know about, haven't thought about. Um, there are some things that are going on that seem to be, like, 100% wrong. Um, but, yeah. So, the... And not, not all places are like this, either. Like, if you go to Papua New Guinea, you can put missionary on your visa because they want missionaries to come share the gospel. Um but Paul in Second Corinthians two and Second Corinthians four gives some good guidelines. Um, in Second Corinthians two seventeen, um, Jeremy talked about this morning. We're not like peddlers. We're not like so many peddlers of God's word. Um, but if, as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God in the sight of God, we we speak in Christ. And so you see the contrast of peddling God's word versus being men of sincerity. Um, the, the notion of, of peddling people who are, are trading money for goods. Um, you, you mentioned you don't know of any like specific examples of... I hear of it, but without being able... Without being able to, not the details. I don't want to condemn anything in particular, but I have the impression, and I hear reports of things like that happening in poor regions, and I get, it makes my blood boil. Yeah. <laughs> yes, well, so... Especially that's the prosperity gospel. Yeah, speaking of prosperity gospel. God will make you rich, so give me your money. Um, I, I was doing a little bit of research, and it turns out earlier this year, Benny Hinn and his ministry went to Kenya. Um, they filled the Nyayo Stadium with, they said, more than half a million people jammed into the 150,000 seats inside the stadium. And so you see this gospel or this prosperity gospel preacher bring in this huge crowd. The average, anybody guess what the average income is a day in Kenya? It's actually up from $2. It's now at $6. So the average person makes $6 a day. Any guess as to how much it costs to put on a show that half a million people attend? 
I, I have no clue, and I couldn't find that. He was hoping. He was hoping you. He was hoping you tell him. Yeah. It's a lot of money. They, the government worked with local churches to fund all of that, and so the government. I don't know if they enticed or, you know, suggested, but basically the local churches in Kenya paid for Benny Hinn to come in to do his ministry. One church gave $100,000 U.S. dollars. Think, think about that. Like $6 a day is what the average person makes. They gave $100,000 for Benny Hinn to come in. At the end of the day, they don't, Benny Hinn doesn't release financial statements about how much they make at events. He's got jets. But he has jets. That's right. <laughs> that jet fuel. But all that to say, like, he came in, I think the, the goal was that he preach a blessing over the country, took all their money and left. Um, it, it's sad seeing the, the kind of stuff going on. So, like, that would probably fall under the category of peddling God's word, right? Probably. Yep. But, I mean, there are other, that's a pretty obvious one, right? Pretty blatant one. Um, what about cunning. So 2 Corinthians 4, um, 2. 2. We have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but by open statement of the truth. So refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. Um, Can anybody think of an example with just in general life, someone being cunning in in ordinary life. Specifically, like, deceiving to get a desired outcome. Happens in, youth <laughs> Happens in youth groups all the time, where it's like, you know, they try to sucker the kids in with like, come, we're going to have a fun night, where it's going to be games and food, and, oh, by the way, we'll sneak in a little gospel at the end, because we want to try to reach our unsaved people. Right, exactly. Yeah, to, yeah, to the degree it's bait and switch. I mean, I think you can... Have fun and do that, but there definitely can be a bait and switch approach. We surprised you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Surprise, we're also going to preach the gospel to you. Yeah. Yeah. Timeshares? Anyone? <laughs> just Go come in a for meeting. a quick advertisement. We just want to talk to you about a timeshare. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And then you buy a timeshare. No. So, what does it look like in missions? So, people might. Be can or be encouraged to you know listen to stories or you know get your friends together so that you can listen to this thing and it will change your life. And really, what they're doing is just trying to plant a Bible story in them that they then talk about and want to or are supposed to share with other people. And it's like if your goal is evangelism and discipleship trying to get them to hey listen to a story you're not you're not accomplishing your goal you're not being very open with what your end goal is and so open statement of the truth is very different than than some of those things that are going in um insider movements um, do, do you guys know the term insider movement Why yeah give them a definition of the insider movement okay so that would probably be Pastor Jeremy's guest week coming into our class to talk about the insider movement. But basically, okay. what level of removal does um, a, a Muslim need to do in order to be considered a Christian? So can you faithfully um, come to Christ and still pray five times a day? Probably. Okay. Can you pray facing Mecca? Can you pray facing Mecca? Sure. Okay. Can you call God Allah instead of God? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Can you say Muhammad is his prophet? Yeah. If Muhammad said some true things, like, is he a prophet in that sense? There, mm. there, there was a whole movement in the insider movement to, to basically, can Muslims view themselves, continue to view themselves as Muslims and continue in the mosque system and yet be Christians? And there is a lot of stretching and back flipping to try to say, yes, they can. And that's what the inside, remain inside the mosque. That's what the inside is in reference to. And so there's a lot, and, and, and there's variation. Like, 
if you're praying five times a day towards Mecca, I'm not going to condemn it. it might not encourage it, but mm-hmm. I'm not going to rebuke it. Allah just means God. It's like the Old Testament Elohim. Um, is the argument, oh, okay. Um, and I want to say Muhammad's his prophet because he didn't get everything wrong. And to the degree Muhammad got anything right, isn't he in some sense a prophet? This is the arguments being made. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so we hope to spend the whole session on that, but that's just another example of the, the bait and switch, the not being open um, in, in what you're doing. When removing the Son of God language? Yeah, that would be tampering with God's word. Yeah. So that's the second part of Second Corinthians 4, is refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. Um, and so, yeah, it's common in especially Muslim translations, to try to remove Trinitarian language because they, they have different ideas when they hear, you know, Jesus is the Son of God. Um, and so let's just not even open that can of worms and replace that language with something that makes more sense with them. Which, that's not... The, the heart desire is still a good desire, I think. Like, you... You want more people to come to faith, right? We want people to be saved. This is a, a stumbling block to them, so let's just get that out of the way so that more people can come to Jesus, right? Deb? Does that also include when you're putting something else on your visa, even though you intend to be a Ooh, missionary? That is, that is a good question. It's almost like she read your sheet out. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Um, be- before potentially. I, before, before you get to that, let me mm-hmm. just make one other point. Another way that you might be more familiar with, have you ever heard of a popular Bible teacher saying the church needs to unhitch from the Old Testament? The whole argument is evangelistic. The Old Testament has too much freight of weight to justify that when someone comes, what about the Amalekites? What about the genocides? What about slavery? What about um, polygamy? What about, and they, his whole argument is in order to save people, detach surrender, don't defend, all of that unhitched from the Old Testament. You're tampering with God's word. Don't do it. So, but it's entirely evangelistically motivated. That's the entire justification. The same thing might be people that want to quibble over LGBTQ plus issues so that they can get a hearing. We want to save people. So we can, we can kind of just, you know, no comment. What's your view on that? Uh, no comment. And plead the fifth. You're tampering. No. Open, clear admission of the truth. Because, again, your goal isn't just to get them saved. Your goal is to make disciples. Um, and so that's partly where this becomes a problem, is you get people saying, look, let's not even deal with any of those things. The, the, the Bible's sexual ethics are so offensive to our culture. Couldn't we set that aside and just preach Christ? No. You can't. Now, I'm not saying you've got to front load it. It's not saying every missionary and Muslim has got to say, have a shirt that says Muhammad's a false prophet on it. But if they ask you, like, hey, what do you think about Muhammad? I think he teaches the doctrine of demons. You know, like, that's, that's what I think, if you ask. Anyway, sorry. Mm-hmm. And I, sh- I should step back. I don't know how, how many translations are like that. I just know it's a thing, and so I shouldn't say, oh, it's all over the place, but yeah. it, it is a thing. Um, yeah. The, what was I going to say? Oh, um, just because... We don't want to tamper with God's word, but that doesn't mean that it's wrong to um, change lingo that we're using, like just in everyday life. And so if you go to a Muslim nation, they have a very um, stereotypical way of thinking of missionaries. And so if you come and you say, hey, I'm a missionary, like they put you, you're in a box and you can't get out of that box. And so, and so they might say, like, cross-cultural the box might resemble work. the coffin. Yeah, right. saying, yes. <laughs> there you go, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, and, and so it's not that it's wrong to ever, you know, change language based on your context. You have to be careful on what you're doing it with, though. Like, are you tampering with God's word when you're doing it? Or are you trying to correct, like, just a, a stereotype that, that people might have yeah. in, in the culture, based on the culture? Visas, that's... Visas are just an interesting conundrum because in Bible times you don't have to state why you're coming to a country, right? You just go. Um, 
is it okay to lie on a visa? So God, God is sovereign over all the world, and we are his children, right? And as Jesus said, the sons are free, and so shouldn't we be free to just go into the country to share the gospel? And if it takes, you know, saying something on a visa to get in, like, okay, well, that's fine, because we're going on behalf of the king. Um, that very much doesn't feel like open statement of the truth. Um, well, and the, and the counterpoint, when the... If you want to say, I don't recognize your right to keep me out, sneak in, sure. You know, like, I don't recognize you have the authority to tell me not to come preach Christ here. Go, good for you, fair enough. I'm going to lie to you about that. If, that. if that logic held, then when the Pharisees charged Peter and John to not preach in this name anymore, they could have said, sure, we won't. And they would have saved themselves a beating. And they didn't. They said, whether it's right for us to obey you or God, you decide. We cannot do any other but preach Christ. So if the disciples aren't free to lie to the face of, we just think it's less lying because it's a form on a paper that you signed. But if you're you're saying, I will not, and it depends the details of what you're signing, but if you are basically saying clearly, I will not try to proselytize or change anyone's religion, you're lying. Mm -hmm. And you're doing something God can't do. There's not many things the Bible says God can't do, but he can't lie. And he can't deny himself. And I think that's my list exhaustively of what Scripture says God can't do. So you've picked one of the two things he can't do to go do for his glory. Yay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That being said, like some of... Go ahead. Carol. And Zeb. And Zeb. Sorry, I had it first. Um, (laughs) So going back to the um, kind of circling back to this idea of the the insider movement or, or like minimizing the truth claims of Christianity. Um, it seems to me like that is really, it kind of gets to the heart of like, what is Christianity to the point where if you are stripping away so many of the truth claims of Christianity that a Muslim would be comfortable continuing in functional Islam and they'd see, um, no, they'd see no dissonance. Yeah. Th- that, like, at, at what point does it cease to be Christianity and start to just be, like, some weird sect of Islam where it's really, like... It's messianic uh, Islam. Y- yeah. It, it. Where it, it's, like, if you are, if you are willing, like, historically the church has, um, has come down that, like, the doctrine of the Trinity is definitional of Christianity. And so... You, if you reject the doctrine of the Trinity, like you may not fully understand it, you may not say, like know it enough to say, okay, yeah, I'm fully on board with that. But if you're like, no, I reject the doctrine of the Trinity. No, I am not. A let me let me give you a firmer foundation than even the historic. The Great Commission commands us to baptize them in the name singular. God has one name, right? And it's the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. If you tamper with that, you are fundamentally disobeying the Great Commission. God help you. And he won't. Yeah. No, I, yeah. And to, I guess, to that regard, um, like, it just seems like that highlights the necessity of having theologically trained uh, missionaries. Like, where, that's what seems like where you're talking about the guy who just decides to go to, India or, or right. wherever it is, and I'm going to be a missionary out there. It's like, okay, who's holding you accountable? Right. How do we know that you're even like anything that would be considered even like a, a Orthodox, right. like small O Orthodox Christian? Yeah, yeah. Well, no, and that's, you remember the disciples encountered somebody preaching Jesus and they wanted Jesus to tell them to stop because he wasn't part of them. And Jesus said, look, if he's, if, I mean, there's a sense in which even Paul in prison knows people are preaching out of envy. But if he got the gospel right, he's like, yay, I rejoice. So the sense in which I don't want to cast stones, I have no interest, and I don't think as Christians I wouldn't encourage us having interest, and certainly no obligation to support self-sent people. They, they can't be the ones. If the guys in Third John go back and make reports to John's church, that's how John knows about Gaius' faithfulness. They reported, witnessed, martyred in front of the church to your truth and walking in the truth. So yeah, this is the pattern we have biblically. So if, if you're sending yourself, you're off the page. And like God can deal with you. 
And I'm not going to condemn it, but it's nothing I want to encourage, emulate, or reproduce. Yeah. Okay. Carol. Okay, I'm going back to, I'm going back to the visa thing. Mm-hmm. Okay, and I think what Deb was talking about was, you know, we have we have missionaries currently that are in countries. Um, what was it? The Tories that were involved in the water project, mm-hmm. and uh, the ransoms are. Yeah. I don't know. Teaching. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean. They really are doing those things, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I don't think they lied on their visas. Right. But, right. but they're, that's not really their main goal. Right. Their main goal is to make disciples, so, right? Yes. So there's a, there's a little bit of gray area when it comes to selectively answering things. We have the example of Samuel telling the Lord. The Lord says, go anoint the one I'm going to show you in David's house. And Samuel says, if Saul hears word of this, you'll kill me. If Saul says, what are you doing? Say, I'm going to go offer a sacrifice, which is exactly what he does. And he omits a rather significant part. He doesn't lie. He definitely misleads a little bit. So there seems to be some room where you're not lying, right? Um, You are selectively reporting on things. So I think there's a difference between lying, saying the thing that is not. God can mislead. God can say certain parts and leave other parts out. He, he, I can give you examples that God never says the thing that is not. God's word always corresponds to what is, because what is corresponds to his word. He speaks and it comes to be. It's just it's impossible to consider God speaking and reality not conforming to it. Um, so there's a difference between those two things, and, I, and, and there's some gray area there. So I really am doing this. Now, if they, if, I don't, if they said... Please confirm you're not coming as a missionary and you're not coming with the intention of proselytizing anyone. And they checked that off. I, that would sound to me like a lie. Yeah. Well, all, all of us, when we, I mean, we should anyway, when we go to work, I mean, our ultimate goal in life is to make disciples, right? Mm-hmm. If we're a part yeah. of the church. Yeah. And, but that's not what we tell our employer yeah. when we fill out the... Uh, yeah. <laughs> I know. Mm-hmm. Sure. So right. it's like, what are you coming to do? I'm coming to get this job. And you know, economically, that's what they're interested in. Are you coming in to be a freeloader to get their social services? No, I'm coming with a job. Yep. That is probably the most priority they want to know about. Are you coming as a freeloader or are you coming to produce? I'm coming to produce. I got this job. Like, it may well be that they don't care. I'm also coming to be a tourist and see your sites. But you didn't say that either. It, part of it gets down to what do they want. And it's clear some countries want them to t- tell us. Tell us. Are you going to come and preach Christ? That's where I think it, it becomes much more like, I, I don't see how you can... Be faithful and no, you know. Yeah, a, a lot of the countries too that um, are still unreached are the countries that have a lot of physical needs, and so there's a lot of of room for things that you can do in those countries to just be a blessing to the people. We, I mean, um, Carol, you mentioned water, the water project. Um, Ericsson's were doing soybean processing, like helping the locals. Um, grow soybeans. Um, I know of people that have, uh, they were going to do a fish, fish hatchery. People do English schools. Like all of these things are legitimate things that they're doing in these countries that are blessings to the people, right? And so I think it's fine to put that on a visa. Um, yes. Oh, dear. Mrs. Kidder. So, Alex. Uh huh. If you. <laughs> down to the lowest common denominator, would it not be if you're being paid by an organization or a church, your, your, your expenses are being paid, does that not constitute an official definition from the point of view of the receiving country for whether you're a missionary or just simply a conscientious Christian who wants every opportunity to share his faith. Well, I think that... She's not done. Oh, no, go ahead. <laughs> She's not holding I, the I mic. I know from experience. The mic's over here. Does that, is that not the one thing that makes the difference? It's a question. So, if I understand, the, the question is... The fact that they're being supported solely by a church to go over and do this work, doesn't that mean that they would then be a missionary and need to put that on their visa? Is that, that the question? Um, 
so the the people that are doing these things are making money through the projects. Um, it's not nearly enough to cover all of their um, ministry expenses and living expenses, um, but the the government would find it very odd if you say, "Hey, I'm here to you know start a business that makes no money and like doesn't have any reportable income." Um, and so, yes, it would be odd, but at the same time, the the details are going to matter. The details matter, and it's. I would still say it's okay, even if you are being supported, to go and put, you know, I'm going to do a soybean processing plant on your visa, because at the end of the day, that's what the government is going to care about from... They're, they're not asking, hey, are you going to be a missionary on the visa? If they were, right? and you have dodged that, we have the example of in Acts for the, the early church, stop preaching this name. No, we won't. You know, so... But maybe, if they're not asking that... Maybe that's the key, then. Like, on the, on the visa, they're not asking you, hey, are you going to be a missionary? Are you going to evangelize? Are you going to proselytize? No, they're asking, hey, why are you coming to the country? It's like, well, I'm going to bless the people by standing up a soybean processing plant. And, and it's legitimate to assume that's the government's primary interest. I'm going to add to the economy. I'm going to train people. I'm going to be a boon and not a detriment. Yes. I wasn't aware of people swearing them in when they signed visas. You're right. In court, where you've said, I swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, that would be a different context. We, this is, we have this banter regularly. Um, but sorry, we got all sorts of hands and we got three minutes. I'm not even going to get to my. Next week, we'll get to your question. No, it um, probably won't be next week. No, it won't be next week. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so when these people are in doing soybean work or water work, what are they like? Is this like friendship evangelism? Because is there going to be a bold preaching going on? Or Yeah, so y- you meet how bo- people. How bold can you be, is, I guess, would be the question. I, I think part of that is based on conscience. Because if the government, if you know that the government is frowning upon making disciples and your goal is to make disciples, I think that you have every right to make disciples in that country. Um, The level of boldness will depend on on the missionary, I think. Yeah, I'm in a men's Bible study. We're going through some church history, and at one point in France, the Huguenots, the Protestants, were only allowed to gather and, and evangelize out of the city, not in a building, and in the daytime. And there's a sense in which, well, then do that. Like, I think, let me, let me end this with a text, 1 Corinthians 9. I'm going to print out um, a copy of a message by D.A. Carson specifically dealing with the insider movement. He answers it from this passage. It's, I'll have about 20 or 30 of these in the next week or so. If you want to know what's the insider movement, you can just, it's, it's fantastic. But 1 Corinthians 9, there is legitimacy to flex. Paul recognizes he flexes. And so it takes discernment and wisdom. What can we flex with and what can't we? Because absolutely removing unnecessary obstacles, like eating food that offends them. I'm not going to eat pork evangelizing a Muslim. <laughs> Fair enough. And so it's not as though we're just to just take it as you like it. The truth hurts. I mean, there is legitimacy. We need, we need to prayerfully consider where can we flex, where can't we? And even the difficulty of, okay, what is the visa asking? It's going to come down to the exact wording of exactly what they're asking and what they're, what they're looking for. But here's the model. 1 Corinthians 9, 19. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a slave to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became a Jew in order to win the Jews. He had Timothy circumcised. Timothy had a lot of trust in Paul. (laughs) But so as not to offend him when when he brought him into the temple. They rioted anyway. But that was the lengths Paul was willing to go to, so as not to offend the Jews in his evangelism of them. Right? That's pretty extreme. Um, To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being under the law myself. I didn't strict to kosher food laws because I had to. I was free not to, but I was happy to do it. 
so as not to offend them, right? That I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, which is to say he couldn't just do anything. If they wanted to go to a brothel, he didn't go along. But where he could, he, he acted like a pagan to whatever way he could without disobeying Christ. That I might win those um, under the law, okay, not being outside the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. So there need to be some very thoughtful, prayerful, intentional discussions of where can we flex and where can't we. And that's probably going to be something that needs a lot more prayer and work and, and exegetical, biblical, what can we faithfully do, what can't we faithfully do, thinking things through. But that is exactly the challenge. Because the argument for all of this, unhitching, is just, I, 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 it's, a good mo- it's a good motive. I want to get unnecessary hindrances out of the way. The Old Testament is not an unnecessary hindrance. You know? um, we are at time. We can stick around for a few minutes longer. And Alex's ABF will continue. And we got one more week of this, so thank you.